Welcome to the International Schools Podcast, where we discuss all aspects of technology and life in international schools, with new episodes live every two weeks. This podcast is sponsored by Apps Events. We're a Google for Education partner and active since the launch of Google Apps for Education in 2006. We're a team of former educators and all experts in helping schools integrate Google into their schools and their classrooms. All training is customized for each school and we make sure it has a lasting impact. Literally thousands of educators worldwide have earned their Google Educator certification with us with our certification boot camps and these take place every month and get your staff certified quickly. We also host Google Summits which are fun two-day conference style events with concurrent sessions and keynotes delivered by experienced Google trainers teaching on a broad range of topics using G Suite both in the classroom and in the school. Check it out over at appsevents.com and we can bring any of these events to your school, which is an amazing way to build a Google community amongst your staff to support each other, plus to increase the profile of yourself and your school. The podcast is also brought to you by Acer for Education. People ask us what Chromebooks we recommend for schools, and after trying them all quite literally, we always recommend Acer. We've been to Acer headquarters in Taiwan to be part of product discussions, and they're genuinely the best thought out, most cost-effective, and most importantly durable devices out there. They're always innovating, including the first tablet running Chrome, and the first convertible touchscreen Chromebook. The latest version of this is a Spin 11, which has a stylus and two cameras, and we highly, highly recommend it for schools. They, of course, have a full range of Windows laptops, and for eSports fans, their Predator range is second to none. If you'd like more information, please just leave your email over at gg.gg forward slash Acer Education. That's gg.gg forward slash Acer Education, and we'll get right back to you. And now, on to the interview. Hi, welcome to the International Schools Podcast. Um, Today, I'm delighted to be talking with Aaron Monis and Steve Sostak from Inspire Citizens. I probably said your names names wrong, guys, but um, they are living in China and they run an organization called Inspire Citizens. We're going to talk about what it is. It's all to do with global citizenship and a bunch of other things. It's they're doing a lot, to be honest. So there's a lot to get into. But uh, welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks for having us, Dan. Thank you. Pleasure cool. to be here. Yeah. Well, guys, I want to start off by talking a bit about China because everyone is, you know, the thing that's interesting is. What, people maybe thinking about going to work there. You guys have been in Beijing for a while. Like, what was it like? Like, talk me through, like, how did you guys end up in China in the first place? You, you both went to work for the same school, I believe, in the beginning. So how, how did it all go in the beginning? How did you end up there? And, and, and what was it like in the beginning? Um, I'll start. So I've been teaching. I was teaching internationally with my, my wife and uh, my family was traveling with us for the last, actually, it's been now 15 years, right? And uh, the first overseas job I had was down in Peru. Uh, Kind of a crazy story down there, too. We adopted a couple older girls and um, had a baby two months later and Insta family, two languages. And we had our two dogs. And um, in the process of kind of networking and having a great experience, you know, working in the elementary PYP there and doing some service learning there, uh, some colleagues of uh, mine brought us over to Malaysia. So I think the first thing with these international schools is if you if you're doing a good job and doing quality work and you get into that network, it tends to be interesting how much you follow some of your close colleagues and friends that really respect the type of work that you're doing. So then I was in Malaysia for five years. That's where I got really into the global citizenship work. I was running a, uh, um, an elective down there and that sort of started to really blossom. And that kind of got the word out about uh, myself as a teacher and the type of things I was doing. And then that put us in contact with international school of Beijing. And really, that's kind of how I ended up there. It was an opportunity to be very innovative uh, in a place that I had never been. I had never been to China before that. And uh, it was a really awesome opportunity, great school to get my girls at. And uh, my wife teaches IB math. So it was just a good fit for, uh, for the family. And, you know, China's been, China's been amazing. So we'll t- we can talk about that in a minute. But Aaron's background. Go ahead, man. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, uh, before Beijing, I was in Casablanca at Casablanca American School. Right. And there I was the head of the talented and gifted remedial reading EAL and learning support for middle school and high school. Right. And it was a lot of hats. 
But then uh, International School of Beijing is renowned for its student services program and for the resources that they put into uh, inclusion. And when I found out that they were hiring and I found out that they were interested in somebody with my background, uh, it was a really, really natural fit. And one interview turned into a job offer a day later. And my wife and I decided that you know, leaving Morocco for new horizons would be great. And I was really excited to take that next step in my professional career where it was, let me focus on one thing really well instead of, you know, having so, to wear so many hats. So I know about that. ISB was really great for supporting and uh, offering resources, especially in terms of inclusion and supporting students. And that's actually how we met. I don't know if you yeah. know the history of that, but <laughs> I, was a, I, was, I was a sixth grade humanities teacher. And I was there a year before Aaron came in, and he was my learning support co-teacher. Right. And you know, we clicked right away, you know, as you know with us. I mean, <laughs> yeah. similar style, similar music taste, similar approach to learning. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of where our relationship started was just happened to be co-teachers that first year Aaron got there. So it's just funny how sometimes uh, you get some synergy and serendipity and everything takes off. Sure. What's it like, uh, the school you work at? Like, oh, school you did work at, sorry, because obviously we'll get into your new thing. But um like, I mean, the, the, the thing everyone talks about with China, the reason people don't want to live in China is like the pollution, traffic, the sort of, that, they're the two big things. Obviously, there's a few other things. But I know, for example, our mutual friend, Dave Freeman, I mean, he likes to be in Taiwan and just commute in and out of China and, you know, live in Taiwan where it's a bit more, less polluted. Like, how, 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 have you, how did you find that in the beginning? Like, just, do you t does the school organize, did they organize accommodation close to the school so you didn't have to travel too much? Or, like, how did that work with the, with the, with the travel and then, secondly, about the pollution as well? You want to start? Um, so I chose to live downtown, about 45 minutes away from the school. Right. And uh, to me, to be honest, a 40, 45, 35, 40-minute drive is not you know, a very long of a drive. And you just put in a good podcast, do a little meditation on the way to school. But also, um, for me, in terms of the pollution, um, the schools have fantastic air filters. Your houses are filtered, like everything. So you don't, you're not really exposed to pollutants a lot of the time. Right. And Beijing has like just in the last four and a bit years that I've been there, you've noticed a, like a marked difference in the amount of pollution, whereas like four years ago, there used to be, you know, 10 days a month that were over 200, you know, and that uh, number has decreased. And we have more blue sky days now than we've ever seen in yeah, Beijing. Yeah. And so really doing a great job. Yeah. And I got, you know, we got there it was the year after sort of that air apocalypse year that they were, you know, it was probably, you know, uh, talked to quite about, excuse me, talked quite a bit about. Yeah. And um, it has been quite a transformation over the, over the last four years. I do think, you know, there's still times where, well, and I live out by the school because my, you know, I had kids so, or I have kids. So them being close to school was more important than us living in the city at the time just because of sports and because of, you know, activities, et cetera, and just the ease of getting to school in the morning. But two things is one, Beijing is a really cosmopolitan city. Like there's, yeah. there's some really amazing history, museums, neighborhoods, the food culture, um, music, yeah. art. And, you know, so that's one thing. And the second thing being is just, I know the people, I think, you, you know, it was one of those things where at first getting used to sort of the Chinese culture and the different, um, sense of, uh, you know, I, coming from, especially from a Latin American country in Peru, where people are a little bit more forthcoming and open. Uh, but at the same time, people in China are, you know, I find them to be really uh, kind, I find them to be extremely patient at times, because, you know, there's a lot of people and you have to show some level of patience. Yeah. I think the one thing I love about there is it's just the incredible feeling of safety. Like it's a, yeah, it's a great place absolutely. for, for I, my kids love it there. You know, I mean, they're, they're going to a wonderful school living, being outside with their friends, especially on, on good quality days. It's just, you know, the neighborhoods are, are safe. You don't have to, you don't have these fears that sometimes, yeah. uh, other places bring. And, um, yeah. I've, I've felt very blessed to be there, to be honest with you. I mean, it, there are some struggles, though, when the, when the air pollution is bad. But, you know, you learn to live with it and you, uh, you learn to be better at getting inside and reading a book or Aaron said, listen to a sure. podcast or watching a film. And What's, it's just kind of how life is. Sure. What is it like, like kind of socially? Does, does it tend to be with the, with the international schools, people hang around with people from their own school and there's, there's kind of a big social scene there? Is that kind of a basis or is it much more? I mean, obviously, everyone, the longer you stay, the more people you meet. But is that is that kind of a basis for the kind of social scene there? Uh, 
It depends. Yeah. If you like that kind of social scene and you feel like you want to, you know, hang out with the families that might live closer to the school or you just connect better with foreigners and international yeah. teachers and you choose to be part of that social scene, it is absolutely there. Um, there are, uh, I think, some of us as well that, you know, you let the music find your friends, yeah, let the art true. find yeah. Yes. And you're able to dip in between your teacher group of friends, but also your Beijing group of friends. So it all depends on what you want and what your comfort level is. There's there's something for everyone. Yes. And the, yeah. one thing that's to be said, though, is like the language is tough, right? There's yeah. no doubt about it. In the sense of for me, I know when I was learning Spanish, being able to even to just read it or to, yeah, uh, you know, to see, exactly. yeah, to see those, Chinese, you know, yeah. the, cog the cognates and stuff. So Chinese for me has been a struggle when I was, especially when I was teaching, you know, 90% of the day in English or, you know, it's just... But my girls are picking up uh, Mandarin quite well. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of how much do you want to get out into that culture. Because, again, people are really uh, – they're just kind. I mean, you go to restaurants. People are willing to work with you. They don't get too frustrated when you're you know, butchering the language or whatever. So um, – <laughs> I think it really depends on the person, but there is a very good community at ISB. Yeah. Uh, I run like a spin class there and a boot camp class. There were parents, teachers, and students will work out together. That's one aspect of that kind of community culture wellness, sure. and then also the, the social stuff. Obviously, for you know teachers, there's a lot of neighborhood places people go just to decompress and hang out. That's cool. I've got, I've got to visit Beijing. You know, I've, I've I haven't really spent much time in China, just Shenzhen and a few places like that, and mostly I've been in. Kind of China light places like Hong Kong and Taiwan, you know, which is kind of you know Chinese culture, but but much more. I don't know, just different, more Western, I guess, and 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 a lot more foreigners. Yeah, Beijing's well, maybe gritty. Taiwan not so much. Hong Kong definitely, but I mean Taiwan is Taiwan's. It seems like it's China light in some ways. You know, it's it's China, but it's 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 a it's a bit different. <laughs> And I think to throw in a last little plug about Beijing, like especially coming, having come from Morocco or having grown up in Abu Dhabi, you know, people don't realize like how much there is to do in Beijing until you actually get there, sure. right? When you, you don't hear much from the outside, but then once you show up and you realize that there's like a, a district of the city that's about the size of 15 city blocks that is just art galleries. Yeah. And there's another oh. town that has nine different concert venues and there's a show every night. So you have to juggle between nine concerts every night. Like it's, there's so much going on there. But so it, it's worth, um, check it out. I see. I, I had no idea, but, but isn't it, isn't yeah. the issue of just like, it just takes too long to get to these places. Like, cause that's the perception everyone has of Beijing is like, you just can't go anywhere because it's just so congested. Well, uh, I mean, I live in, I grew up in Chicago, so I, you know, I see similarities. There's certain times of the day where you're just, going to have to deal with being in a sure, car or, sure. you know, we have DD instead of Uber. So, you know, I have my DD time where I'll often, um, like Aaron said, it's just time for me to kind of take a breather and listen to some music or, or, or maybe yeah, throw out yeah. a tweet or something. But the, the public transportation there actually, yeah. the subway is pretty impressive. Really? The issue again, though, it's such a big city, right? It's broad, yeah. it's, it's wide. It's, it's the breadth of the city is huge. So sometimes even on the subway, getting from one side of the city to the other side can be 75 90 minutes right? right so it's just it's just a big yeah. place you know yeah. but if you like uh skateboards bike lanes and scooters <laughs> you can get around anywhere in the city nice and quick quickly really? so wow, wow. <laughs> cool so guys so i want to get on to a bit about inspire citizens like um do you want to start by saying what it is as an organization and then we can talk about how you ended up kind of starting it, i guess so Aaron's always our elevator pitch guy. So let him roll. <laughs> cool. Well, what we are, I guess, right now we're uh, a partnership. We're two consultants that have basically kind of started a social enterprise where we work with schools to try and take their existing curriculum and their existing programs, develop more empathy, and try and move their curriculum and their learning towards having an impact on other people, communities, the world or their internal community. So it's all about take the existing framework, try and find ways to level up the empathy, give students something to care about, like the world's biggest needs, right? And then give them an opportunity built into curriculum to do something about it. Got it. And it's cool because we've got, you know, now that we've got a number of schools working with us, it can go on a kind of a multiple levels, right? Where we look at one side is what, what you can do sort of as the input side, as the, as the, the policy or the school vision or the, the, the operations of the school, right? And we, that's sort of a global impact school framework where we actually created a self-study for schools so that they can actually, you know, see where they're at and start to identify some next steps. And then collect evidence along the way. So it's almost like a 
accreditation and a full school rollout and implementation plan for how do you move an entire school K to 12 to becoming more globally impactful. Yep. We have that sort of side of what we do. And yeah, and the, then there's the pedagogy that's involved where we have what's called our empathy to impact sort of cycle or approach, yep. which fits very well. Yep. We were talking earlier about design thinking or a services action cycle or a sure. PBL cycle. It, it caters really well to that. And, and basically what it is, is we're trying to get it in the language that makes sense for kids, just calling it care, aware, able, and impact or act, right? right. And that idea of, you know, you have to care if we're going to make an impact, we have to have that piece of empathy. And then the last thing with the... With well, the, and, and even to add on to that, you know, a lot of times when you have an inquiry cycle or you have a PBL cycle or you have design thinking, like they all start with this idea of tuning in or your entry point or your, but, or you're asking questions and interviewing and survey and finding out, right? Yeah. But how are you going to get a student to find out and ask questions and interview if they don't actually feel an empathetic connection or care about it first? The level of engagement that you can get through any of those processes, if you've got a student who cares deeply about something that needs to be, that can be worked on in the world, and they know that at the end of their learning, they're going to have an opportunity to do something or have a positive impact, engagement skyrockets and all of those cycles, inquiry, PBL, design thinking, almost become leveled up just by having an empathy to impact approach. And that's what we've noticed. We've got a lot of sort of evidence of that. So we've been using that as our curricular model that we can apply to any standard based, any sort of pedagogical approach and empathy to impact is what we bring to schools on a curricular level. And are you, are you yeah, generally doing this on, on a kind of a project base where you're saying, look, this is, this is going to take a year, we're going to do a bunch of workshops and we'll follow up. And then as like, cause I mean, obviously you've got to package this in a way that's, that's, that's like, um, cause schools want to, they're going to invest in this. They want to see, we're going to make it this, so in this time time frame, we're going to have this kind of impact. So is that typically how, how, you, how you structure it? It sort of depends, right? So if you came back to what I was saying about that global impact school yeah. model, there's, it almost sets itself up like a menu, right? Yeah. So certain schools we've partnered with already, such as Seoul Foreign School and Beijing City International School, we're looking at something even into two, three years down the road, right? So we're, we're looking at this being a long-term investment in terms of not only – we don't only just come in and do workshops. We're, we're really in the weeds with the teachers. So, you know, getting in the classrooms with them, getting into the team meetings to help with some of the planning to make some of these things happen, running student leadership opportunities yeah. to work on things, the soft skills that are going along with the, you know, the curriculum and what you get with the standards that are already pre-existing. And, yeah. and then also at that level, too, of mission and vision, helping to write, you know, uh, descriptions of programs, yeah. helping to design professional learning so that it's actually well implemented over time, right? We might start with the workshop, we might move it into, um, you know, like uh, department level meetings, we might then go from department level meetings to actually co-teach with a teacher or model teach so that they can observe and then we reflect on that and we set up a plan, we meet with them a month later where they tell us what they need more help with, then we might do another small group training to work on the specific tools that are tailored to their experience and then we do it long-term implementation over time. Yeah. And what's really important about that too is that we don't add more to schools. We take what schools are already doing and yeah. we help teach with standards-based education and inquiry, yeah. but in a way that's leveled up to be global competence or empathy to impact. So what they're already doing and just try and level it up through our approach. So that, and that sets us up really for three tiers, right? Where it's yeah. like we'll have sort of that level one tier where we might come in and do a workshop or a speaking engagement, right? Um, just to get people sparked. A level two might be something like where you come in and work with a school for a week. That's a lot more pinpointed. So for example, we're going to be in Singapore looking just at a grade seven and yeah. looking at how we can sort of add global citizenship into the units like and pilot, also bringing in that. So they, they're, they're doing that. We're going to do a pilot and see how that goes and then we can expand it school wide. Or exactly. With global youth media in there as well. And then the last piece would be going more all in, like we just talked about, where it's a slower transformation, and they, you know, get us on the ground a lot more with the with the staff. And you can uh, and, and, so it's self-sustaining pretty quickly, so the school can can run this by itself. The, yeah, that's the whole point too. Is that like a, a lot of a lot of the research around professional learning uh, shows that if you if you do just the workshop, 
right? The teachers are going to take stuff away, but then when they get back to school on Monday and they have their jobs to do and they have, it's really difficult for the stuff to be deeply implemented into the school and into the school culture. But if you can do it in a way that is a transformational approach with a long-term implementation plan and combines like what we call our design principles of professional learning, right? And you have all the right needs to support implementation of the stuff, then you get a full school rollout. And another fun fact about us is that um, we try to make sure that we are accessible so that schools can sort of do long-term engagements with us, whereas there are other people that, I'm not going to say that, let's just say we like to try to make ourselves accessible so that yeah, we yeah, can yeah. have longer. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's the same, obviously, with any, you always got it like, I think it's partly like just, just an age thing being because I think people, especially people, I, so many people in their 20s now, for example, they're just not used to being on the phone. And for me, if someone calls me, I always, I take the call or I call them back, you know? But I, I've got, I know plenty yeah. of people, and, I, and specifically with younger age groups, when they just, they just, you're never going to get a call back, you know? I'll get an SMS saying, what did you call me about, you know? And I think the accessible thing is, like for me, if I work with anyone, people I've worked with 10 years ago, you know, they can call me up and we'll talk and I'll help, I'll help you know, help them out with whatever they're working on, you know? And I think it's, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying people who are younger are not responsive. I just think they have a different way of communicating, and I'm just used to people getting back in touch with me, and I just deal with it, you know. <laughs> oh, for sure, and just that idea of being able to take the deep dive, right? Yeah. And uh, and and you and in order to do that, if that's what we believe in, you know, you have to make sure that that accessibility piece is there, and you know, that's something that we've kind of like Aaron was saying, it's in our design principles and really in our mission, and you know, something that this is where the trick is now is how do we sort of systematize some of these things in a way that we don't lose that right yeah. and that's as we start to look at training other people slash you know coming up with these different types of systems approaches that also can still be personalized to the the different contexts of the different schools whether it's educationally culturally or geographically right everybody's yeah. different all clients just like our students right sure. we have to make sure that we can tweak tweak some of those structures and personalize for the institution and their context just like you would for your students right so. Do you think there's? Do you think like part of this is? Do you think there's an issue with at least some international schools where they kind of realize they become a bit isolate, a bit isolated, and and you know they don't want to just be seen as a way to educate you know privileged local people and, and and expats you know and they want to be more involved in the community. Do you think? Do you think? I mean, I'm I'm not talking about the kind of schools you're working with, but I'm talking about some schools. Do you think that's been an issue for them and it, something they maybe want to correct? Um, I think. I think schools understand that the 1% of the 1% or, you know, some of the top 1%, some of the students who are going to have the best career opportunities in the world, some of the students that are going to become leaders and politicians yeah. are the ones that they are educating. Yes, and yes. if you can get to them and they can help them to become impactful, sustainable, global citizens, yeah. then they know that the impact on the world will be large. That's and a I, great point, some yeah. of them might, might come from that maybe, you know, guilt side. But I think most schools now are understanding that global citizenship is no longer just a little checkbox. Sure. It's something that our world needs. It's something that our com- that our school communities need and that our children need going forward. Sure. And I think that's been the sort of big revelation for international schools and why, you know, there's been so much of a demand for this kind of work, especially yeah, systematic. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I think too, I think too, Dan, it ties into things, you know, we were just talking about is that idea of, um, it, it doesn't have to be another thing, right? Yeah. It's something yeah. that if done well, and if you, you know, if you seamlessly can work some of these, you know, sustainable development goals or global competencies, whatever you want to call them into the curriculum, really the learning should be amplified, right? Yeah. Yes. Kids are going to understand the why before the will, right? Sure. In the sense of, you know, why am I learning these skills? How can I use these skills? Not only to maybe fulfill a personal passion, but also something that's outside of me, right? And that's where that sweet spot is. And I think, I think schools see that when kids and teachers too get the sort of the, you know, the feeling of fulfillment when you're actually doing something that's more than just for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, it just levels everything up, right? And it really gives. Um, And I think that's where right now people are starting to see that shift is like, this is not going to lower your IV scores. This is not going to affect the SATs. This is is, all this is going to do is, you know, hopefully just make kids 
better people yeah. and still achieve in school, right? And that's so, and do great for the world. I mean, those are all wins, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know for sure, just, I mean, like, you know, I've got a, a young son now and this, you know, I would want him to go to a school that had incorporated some of these principles in terms of, you know, thinking globally, you know, just because, I mean, just because of the way I, I kind of work, you know, I, I'm very globally minded, I guess, just I'm fortunate, very fortunate to be able to work all around the world, you know, and I guess you guys as well. So it's, uh, it's given me a different perspective, you know, on like, not like, you know, I, I can't watch like British TV or American TV because it's so just focused on, you know, like <laughs> now we're going to hate Trump and this, this week, North Korea, North Korea is an enemy. And then next week it's China. And it's just like, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't do it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I sound like I'm some kind of snob who's just elitist, but I like, I, you know, the more you travel and the more you see, it's like, there's just, there's a lot of, you know, the world's a big place. And then, and, and I think it's great to have that perspective. I definitely want him to have that perspective, you know? Oh, for sure. And actually one of the things you brought up is actually in one of our student, you know, our profile, we call it the student impact profile. Like what is a globally competent student? Yeah. And it's like that idea of responsible consumption and production yeah. of media, yeah, right? Exactly. It's, we get keep completely bombarded by the things you're talking about. And again, we want to shift that narrative with kids to say, one, are we being skeptical, skeptical about the information that we're receiving? And then also being able to look at it and say, you know, why is it coming in the way it is? Or why is it so negative, for example, like you're talking about? And then be able to give the kids the tool to analyze that, but then also to produce something that's positive, right? Yeah. Like, a, like a podcast like this. We should Kids should have more and more opportunities to have these kind of opportunities to share positive stories and positive information and reframe their world in a, in a way that is, you know, where they feel like they can, they can do good. Yeah. And isn't that, you know, your media stuff looks cool. I, I got inspired. There's a guy called Dan Norris who I know he's an entrepreneur in Australia and he's done a bunch of stuff. He's done some online companies. He's co-founded a brewery and, and I, I saw him give a talk and he had this quote, which is create more than you consume, you know, and, and I've, I've tried to follow that and it's, it's really hard. It's actually really hard, you know, but that's one of the reasons I did this podcast. I, we, you know, we're doing YouTube videos. I mean, all kinds of things. And it's great to get that mentality in, in, in creating more than you consume, even if, you know, it doesn't work out on an hour to hour basis, because, you know, just from doing things like this, you build up a, it's a small audience, but it's like, it's niche. It's really, and you connect with people globally. And I think getting kids to start, just thinking about being creators, you know, and not and not stressing so much that they only have like three views on their YouTube, you know, or whatever. It's it's a slow, it's a long term process, and it's a mindset issue, you know. Most yeah. definitely. Yeah. Well, and um, so we sort of, I guess, we have our global impact schools model. Yeah. We have our, you know, um, inspire citizens impact profile of how to look at student evidence and student competencies. Um, we have our empathy to impact and we have another student leadership program that we sort of run our kind of fifth program that we focus on sometimes embedded into the bigger global impact schools model or sometimes as a standalone or sometimes integrated into curriculum is this thing called global youth media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where we work with schools on, you know, we take the, you know, uh, design thinking and especially the MYP uh, design criterion in their classes and design cycle and we take things like podcasting things like um how to use uh, camera and media how to do documentary how to create video how to do all these kinds of things and it's all based around how can you use media for good yeah. right and some people want to embed it to their design curriculum some people like uh singapore american school want to embed it actually to their humanities curriculums so that their humanities curriculum is being turned into media sources where hundreds of students can compile things online and share and read and consume each other's work yeah. and it's just awesome because there's so many different types of tech tools there's so much digital literacy integration there's so many tech standards and you know uh, curricular standards that can be integrated into that and we're calling it global youth media but it's starting to take off now and there's about five or six different schools that are developing programs we even have a school here Seoul foreign school Shout out to Seoul Foreign School. They use their um, eighth grade MYP design class to do uh, global, they call it Voice Lab. You can check out Voice Lab online. And now they're eighth graders. They learn about the skills on how to create community journalism. They then host a big event at the end of the year where they invite hundreds of students from different schools all over the world. The students then lead workshops, teach workshops, lead the whole weekend where they bring students from all over the world out into uh, the community the, the, the community around the school within Seoul. And they interview people about what are 
pressing issues or what are things that they wish they could tell about their story, about themselves or about their community. Yeah, and yeah. then they teach all these kids from all over the world to get the inside of soul and then turn it into this awesome media piece that involves music. Uh, you've got like a soundscaping, you've got, you know, uh, oh, different types of techniques and media and it's great. And it, it was literally like a, how do I take my design class away from woodworking? And now it's turned into this international global youth media conference that now teaches hundreds of kids every year. And next year, it's probably going to be bigger as well. So it's so cool that if you just link student learning uh, to something that actually has an impact on other people, whether it be the community or other students, it spirals and yeah. everybody wants to be part of it. And that's, and that's with all and that's with all due respect to woodworking because I was a carpenter oh, and, I, and I did hard, I, I, I did hardwood floors for many years back. I also day. used to work <laughs> construction before I was a teacher, so yeah, yeah. nothing against women in woodwork. No, like, even within the woodworking, there's that idea yes. of design for impact, design for change, which there's a wonderful group out there called Design for Change, uh, where you can just you know what are we what are we building for, and if we can identify something that uh, can, you know, just add a little bit more of an element of caring and a, and a purpose. It just it just makes everything, I think, just pop a little bit better. Sure. I mean, just, just to sort of take a step back, we've kind of gone in a, a strange way, I guess, thanks to, thanks to me, but uh, how, did, how did this start? You know, how did you end up leaving your, your great jobs at a great school? Like, what was, I mean, I presume you started, this was something you were working on as a kind of side project, and then it became something that we'd like to work this full time. Yeah, I think, well, the first thing was, it's a kind of a funny story. I may have told you this when we were in Taiwan. I can't remember. But when I went, I first did go to Malaysia, I was just still a fourth grade teacher and working with the student council. And my middle school teacher or my middle school principal, when I wanted to move up to grade six, we had an elective program. And he actually asked me, he said, Steve, I'd like you to do either digital, uh, uh, digital photography or uh, global citizenship. And he's like, I'd really like you to do global citizenship. I think you'd be good at it. And I said, okay, cool, Gary. I go home that night and I get online and I'm like looking for curriculum or resources yeah. and there, there wasn't much. So I called him back and I'm like, I want digital photography. And he's like, nope, you committed to uh, global sit. And actually that was kind of my tipping point. I, I already had done you know, the adoption of my girls. I did a lot of service work in Peru, but I wasn't necessarily bringing it into the curriculum. Yeah. And then when I had, it was kind of forced in essence to do that in Malaysia, it really opened uh, my eyes to how you can really seamlessly work this into curriculum, whether it's even, whether it's in an elective sort of standalone class or in my humanities class at the time. And then when Aaron and I got together, well, go ahead. And I had a little bit of a background. Yep. Remember I said when I was doing uh, um, talented and gifted yep. uh, work, um, we were also doing that where kids were designing their own impact projects with a particular Berber population in the High Atlas Mountains in Morocco. So they were justifying their uh, upskill um, and they were also using these skills to try and have a positive impact on the community. And I loved that, but that wasn't something that uh, I had an opportunity to do when I first got to uh, ISB. And then when Steve and I were talking, we're just like, you do this, you like this kind of yeah. stuff. And we were also co-teachers and we had really good chemistry, but co-facilitating and our same beliefs and pedagogy. And then so we got into, basically we did one ear coast presentation where we were, are we allowed to tell the old name? <laughs> we had a different name before yeah, we were in the <laughs> Oh, it's fine. Right. We were we were called Occupy Middle School. Occupy Middle School. That's quite cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We toned it down. Yeah, I would I would like that, but it depends on your audience, you know. Like it is like. You know. Yeah, and so after that one Earcoast conference, we actually had people that were. That's where we met Dave Freeman, you yeah. know, and that's yeah. where we met our first connections at Seoul Foreign School. They were in that workshop, yeah. and they were just like can you guys come to my school and teach this to my teachers? And then we continued to work at the International School of Beijing, but there was more demand accruing on the side saying, can you come out? So we would do it sort of on our holidays and on our um, you know, breaks. We would go to do some consulting work on the side and eventually became yeah. almost a lucrative yeah. opportunity. Yeah. And we and we got and we got to a point where, you know, there's we felt like, you know, yeah. IS Beijing is doing some great stuff with service learning as well, but there was still like stuck in sort of the pocket of your classroom, right? And I think when we actually started getting into the sustainable development goals and there's specific targets under quality education, one of which is educate for global citizenship, we we just felt like the time was right to yeah. take that, you know, that jump or that leap. And um 
you know, we talk even with the students like we did with the thing today where it's like, what are your talents? And Aaron and I, you know, we felt like we were, you know, strong teachers and that's a talent. And we linked it to this idea of, you know, uh, global citizenship for all. And that really was what became this, you know, our, our personal project, which we became Inspire Citizens. And, you know, we, we did take a leap. There's no doubt about it, but it's been, it's been awesome. We had an amazing first year and we're financially stable, but we're also doing really what we love. And we feel like we just have a bigger impact by being able to get out there more. And I I think too, like obviously everything that Steve has said, but I remember this one moment too in January when we were at like a global issues conference running the media team with our students. And there was was one point where we looked at each other and we're just like, the world needs people that are going to try and bring this kind of education to as many schools as possible. And are we willing to commit ourselves to that, even if it's a rough and rocky road? And we were like, yes, it's, it's important like let's go and that's cool. when we it's, it's handed- great i mean you, you guys did it the right I, I, well there's no right way but it's a, a, a perfect way you know I, i'm fascinated by the whole teacher entrepreneur kind of scene you know i know a lot of stories of things and and, and doing something as a side project is it's a way to see are you, are you really passionate about it do you really want to do this you know because if you really are then you'll you'll work in the evening at 11 o'clock at night on a, on a tuesday to, to work on it you know and that's a pretty good test if you if you're not willing to do that then there's a good sign it's not something you want to do full time afterwards. Oh, well, for sure. How, how can schools? Yeah. Obviously, we're almost up against time, guys. Um, obviously, we'll put links to your stuff. Schools should definitely hire you guys and, and get them in. What about if there's any schools listening, say a local school, they don't have any budget right now? Like, is there any resources they could find to get starting doing some of this stuff by themselves? If there was a way for them just to kick, kind of kick some of these projects off. Well, twofold. Yes, for sure. There's the website, and there's a lot of useful, you know, frames and, yep. and materials there, but. Actually, one of our other targets and our mission is this idea of um, really working towards um, making sure that we're, you know, not closing the door on, uh, you know, because of of resources, right? So, for example, you know, we still do some pro bono work in Kosovo. We we do pro bono work from a distance with people and volunteers and teachers in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, so, one of the things, and as we're building our team, because we're in the process now of expanding slightly, is that sort of and not necessarily philanthropic because we see that as part of our mission is to also educate, you know, and, and, and help teachers become more qualified in global citizenship education in developing areas as well. That's a big push for us. Yep. Um, it's just really just reach out. Like we're, yeah. we're very, yeah, still yeah, very, yeah. I think, about getting back to people in any way if we can, even if it's through a 30 minute Skype that we get a few teachers, local teachers dialed into how to use certain uh, tools we have or, or some of our frameworks, we're pretty happy to do that. And, Great. and go ahead. Yeah. Ahead. And we do have, we do have some resources online. Um, but like I said, because we like to personalize for institutions, like you, we can, you can use the resource, but another conversation or a little bit of understanding about how it fits by either yeah, reaching you out, you know, yeah, sure. or we could make it work for your contest because the things we have are generally applicable to all, but they are available to all if you check out the website. And the last thing, Dan, that is we're in the process. We just actually got the URL for empathy to impact.org. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our frameworks of the global impact school model, the empathy to impact teaching pedagogy and the student impact profile and start collecting evidence from all the different teachers we're working with around the world so that then people can go there and see evidence of what this looks like on the ground Got it. So for another way to sort of have those mentor examples of things that they could do in their classrooms. Good. Yeah. Guys, it was a real pleasure to talk. I want to wish you all the best with this. I'm going to see you guys probably sometime somewhere in Asia this fall. If not, if not, then shortly afterwards. So best of luck and look forward to see you again. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so for, much thanks for the time. time and it was totally enjoyable. Cheers, guys. All right.